figure out what they are, what's going on. Those tusks are going to channel the blade right straight to your face. So they're, they're complicated objects and they've got complicated histories. Hello, foul tarnished. My name is Jeffrey Forgang and I am the Higgins curator of arms and armor and medieval art at the Worcester Art Museum in Worcester, Massachusetts. I've been working with this collection for over 20 years now, and I am also the author of quite a number of books on medieval and Renaissance arms and armor, particularly specializing in the history of sword fighting and other combat techniques. With the General Radon armor, we are moving out of the world of battlefield armors very definitely into the world of purely ceremonial. A really well-dressed Greek warrior might be wearing bronze breastplate and backplate that are sculpted in the form of a human torso. It has this sort of heroic look about it. And he also wears plate armor on his lower legs, his greaves, and he's got an enclosing helmet on his head, a Corinthian style helmet. They often also have mythological scenes on them, mythical beasts or legendary animals. One of their favorite images to incorporate into their armor was lions, an emblem of strength, of courage. It's also an image that is specifically connected to the story of Hercules, who famously slays the Nemean lion. The Greek soldier also has a groin protector called a teruges, these kinds of straps that are dangling around the waist. One reason why you absolutely do not want to wear this armor on the battlefield is those tusks coming out of the side of the head. Looks really impressive, but what I'm seeing as an arms and armor specialist is a funnel that says, hit me in the face, please. One interesting feature of this armor that I know is the shoes. These are actually based on Roman caligae. They've excavated out of the ground, and that's essentially the sort of shoe that you see being worn with this set. The General Redon set is not something that the tarnished would be likely to wear, at least at the point of starting out. This is an extremely expensive armor to make, difficult to maintain, and that would not be an easy thing to do. You've got to pretty much have dedicated servant staff on your payroll in order to keep this kind of armor in decent shape. I would give this armor a nine. Beautifully designed, really quite cool. It's not something I would want to fight in myself, but uh, a, a lot of really great features. Still not so sure about those horns coming out of the head. And I'm definitely not sure I want to be some kind of scrawny horse carrying this amount of bronze around uh, through the desert. Death to the thieves of death. Malachas set is definitely a pretty mean looking armor. It says to me, keep your distance. I am one puppy you do not want to mess with. The laminated structure has been brought in again, lots and lots of repeated lines emphasized by the, the coloration. And then the edges are picked out in gold. The spiky sort of design, these all of these repeated points on the armor here really taken to the extreme, to some degree to the point that it might actually have undermined the efficacy. Uh, it does allow for things to get caught on your armor, which you would not necessarily want in a uh, battle. One really odd feature of this armor is the way the chest is being handled. So he has this beautifully shaped and tinted armor on most of his body. And then the chest is covered with, with scale armor, which is a, a real historical type, but a lot cheaper than the shaped plate steel that he's got elsewhere. Uh, on his body. And on his belly, he's got mail armor, chain mail. That is kind of literally the weakest link. I, when I see that armor, it says, please stab me in the belly. This armor doesn't really fit the tarnished. It's a little bit upscale. There's sort of cheap protection on the torso, but making those arm and leg armor components would have been quite expensive. I would give this armor a six or seven. I would have rated it higher if the, the torso had been treated to the, with the same level of aesthetics, perhaps, that the rest of the suit was treated with.
The Beast Champion armor is shaped by classical armor as interpreted by the Renaissance. The greaves are very much the kind of thing that are inherited from the ancient Greek style of, of equipping the lower legs of a, a battlefield armor. But this is very much not a battlefield armor. The surface seems to be heavily embossed. That is, all these creatures have been hammered into the surface uh, of the metal. The metal is silver. This is not the metal of choice that you want to actually fight in. In most battlefield situations, silver is, is just too soft a metal. You really want something like steel. The helmet of this suit of armor is kind of weird. I find it difficult to really place it in relation to historical examples. Beasts have been incorporated into the head. The shape is really curious to me. The little wings protruding out from the side of the head could be inspired by feathered attachments and such uh, that appears crests. And it would be very uh, difficult, I think, to fight in this armor because the uh, range of vision is so restricted. If you look at the back, much more medieval knightly kind of elements. This guy is wearing a male shirt or male sleeves, perhaps, underneath the outer plate armor. And he seems to be wearing a torso armor that might be a coat of plates or brigandine. That is to say, made of a shell of fabric with metal plates attached to the inside. That seems to be the inspiration in that case. You can also see that he's wearing male shoses, male leggings on his legs to protect the exposed part at the back of the knee, which is again something that medieval knights did. The beast champion armor doesn't really befit the tarnished. This would be a tremendously expensive armor made of silver and gold, hammered laboriously by a top-end craftsman. This is going to set you back a lot of runes. You're not going to be able to afford it. I would give the Beast Champion armor a five. It's elaborate, looks kind of amazing, but to my taste, it's a little bit overdone. The helmet doesn't really make much sense to me. And if you're going to be spending a lot of money on a suit of armor, I'd probably go for one that, that looks good, but still works. <laughs> The Knight's Cavalry armor has a very business-like, downright mean appearance to it. Steel is very prone to rusting, and so they, in fact, had various kinds of treatments, whether chemical treatments, heat treatments, or simply paint that would protect it from rust on campaign. In this case, I gather that the armor is uh, painted with dried blood, which I do not recommend. The helmet on this armor is inspired by a salata. There's a little bit of oddness about the eyes. They'll put the eyes at a kind of a slope. Imagine if you're trying to look left or right through an eye slot like this, you would start to go all squirrely-eyed as a result. Another feature of this armor, the pointed look. You can see particularly those thigh pieces. You can really see how each of those lames, each of those strips of metal ends in a point. And that's something that you often see as a decorative feature on real historical armor, the centuries that it was in use. The groin is very exposed in this suit of armor. Theoretically, a person might wear basically male underpants, chain mail underpants, uh, to, to give you protection in the groin, make people run at the sight of you. This is definitely a, a look that's gonna work for you. But I would say that this knight's cavalry armor definitely befits the tarnished. If you want to really make people run at the sight of you. This is definitely a, a look that's gonna work for you. And by and large, as a functional armor, it, it carries some plausibility. I would rate this armor as a nine. I really love the sort of funereal design, the, the, these, these allusions to the steeds of death and the, the kind of shroud that he's uh, wearing uh, is very, very evocative. May you take the throne. The Crucible Axe set of armor is one that I really quite like. There's a, a kind of melding of Eastern and Western elements in some ways, but the silhouette really suggests Jinbaori that's worn by the samurai in Japan. These broad shoulders with a kind of triangular shape and then the flaring skirt down below. Looking at it, it, it doesn't even really quite look like metal. Perhaps that's suitable for an armor that's not quite of this world. In a lot of ways, I'd say that this armor is something that you could imagine looking fantastic as a cosplay. The part I find most challenging is the 
the helmet. The helmet looks a little strange to me. It seems to be based on a, a medieval barrel helm. The wings on on the side of the head may well be suggested by crests that one sees mounted on a helmet. I'm thinking of a particular medieval manuscript, the Manessa manuscript uh, from the early 1300s, but it's not a helmet I would like to to wear particularly. It's got vertical eye slots, which I find not necessarily very desirable. I'd much rather have them horizontal. As an arms and armor specialist, I kind of like the fact that there are holes in the mail, not that you'd actually want them to be like that, uh, like losing a, a stitch in your your sweater, the whole thing could, could unravel. It does create a, a point of weakness in your armor. The fact that the mail is mounted onto a fabric backing is probably another Japanese-inspired touch. Mail does appear in Japanese armor, and typically this is how it's done. The mail is stitched to some kind of a colored fabric. The elbow guards have these kind of wing-like protrusions on the back. We do have in our collection medieval armor with very pointed toes. And people often ask, is that pointed toe on the foot armor, is that so the knight can kick people in battle? I have to point out, no, it's, that puts you off balance. The hooks on the back of the elbow guards here, maybe could open a bottle for you too. I think this is something that a tarnished would wear with pride. It's got a combination of otherworldliness and a kind of down to earth rough and tumble about it. I would give this suit a nine. I could even go up to a 10 if I were talked around my issues uh, regarding the helmet. Long time friend. Blythe. Blythe's set to me looks like it's something inspired by cavalry armor of the 1600s that's especially visible in the, the lake protections, the sort of laminated multiple sheets of steel uh, riveted together, plus overall the blackened color with white highlights. It's It definitely looks like a pretty workmanlike suit. You can also see the buckles on the biceps holding the arm armor in place. It's a nice little little detail that adds some credibility to the armor. Obviously what's less credible is that he's wearing a wolf's head for his, on his face. The pelt as seen from the back is very suggestive of the straw raincoats that one seen, sometimes sees in East Asia. It's a kind of object that when you've seen it you can never forget it. It's very striking. Blythe's set is something I would definitely see being worn by the Tarnished. This is a very business-like sort of armor that would really be convincing on the battlefield and fairly easy to acquire at an early stage of one's career. I would give this a 9 out of 10. It looks pretty serious and, and usable. The head is a little weird, but that obviously goes with the storyline. And uh, I, I really do uh, do like the design of this armor. You are my true champion. But I really like Lionel's armor. It's pretty unique. This is uh, somebody who probably should uh, spend a bit more time getting out of bed and moving around. A bit. It's been executed with a lot of care and attention. Really looks particularly re realistic in a lot of respects. It's definitely true. A full set of plate armor had to be tailored to your actual shape. If the plate armor doesn't fit you perfectly, it's not going to move with you perfectly. There are a lot of features of this armor that do relate to how real armor was designed and made. When you see double rivets like this, underneath there is a strap of leather, and that leather is helping to hold the armor together as it flexes. A lot of thought has been put into how this armor w might actually work. The gauntlets, for example, which are of the mitten type, it's a sort of easier style to make, easier style to maintain, uh, also provides uh, better protection. The armor is quite distressed. It's got bits of rust, little bits of denting and stuff on it. That's what really happens to armor when it gets used. Really, I really like that feature. I also like that you can see the padded garments that he's wearing underneath. So there's a, a coat with a sort of quilted padding underneath it's visible at his elbows you can also see how that same sort of quilting the helmet's a little bit weird and unusual you do get brimmed styles of helmet in europe and in japan as well but they're typically not as extreme in having 
such a broad brim to it. What this helmet suggests to me more than anything else is a gladiator helmet. You often get certain styles of gladiator wearing broad brimmed helmets. The kind of pierced faceplate that he's got underneath the brim is also suggestive of a, a gladiator helmet. Aside from any potential issues around fit, I would say that Lionel's set of armor could be a perfect starting place for the tarnish. I actually give this armor a nine and could even be convinced to give it a 10 if I can work around my issues with that helmet. This miracle blesses the church to this day. The Carrion Knight set is something that any Renaissance nobleman would be pretty happy to be wearing. It has fundamentally the kind of outline of a, a heavy cavalry armor mid to late 1500s, but it's much more designed along the lines of something that you might wear in a ceremonial context than on a battlefield. The first thing that I'll, I'll note is the helmet. It's called a close helmet. That style is being worn in the 1500s by the most heavily armored cavalry that are, are on the field. And it's also extremely restricted. You can see it's got a very small eye slot. The face is entirely covered. It is above all designed for a fully armored knight who wants to fight with a, a lance, with a spear. The more you add in different styles, different kinds of fighting, different weapons, different modes of operating on the battlefield, the more and more the restricted vision of this helmet becomes a problem. One thing that's really odd about this suit of armor is the way the gauntlets work. This fellow seems to be wearing both a leather gauntlet and a steel gauntlet on top of it. Normally, the steel gauntlet has a leather gauntlet built into it. They're a single unit. They're riveted and stitched together to make it work structurally. I will say that this is a suit that would look fabulous in any kind of a ceremonial occasion. That mixture of hard steel, the blue fabric that he's wearing has a kind of look of embroidered velvet to me. And of course that little mantle uh, with all of the bling attached to it. That is a look that I think a Renaissance gentleman would love to be seen in. And there is what appears to be perhaps embossing all over the surface of the armor, hammered surfaces to get a very intricate kind of decorated look. These bands of mixed steel color, gold color, blackened color, decorated with one band going down the center and a couple of additional bands angling in at the sides. That is something that you absolutely see on real breastplates of the period, and it's really been uh, captured in a very evocative way. I quite like the Carrion Knight set, but I'm not totally sure it would be something that would be suitable for the Tarnished. It's a little bit too fancy, but maybe it's something that the Tarnished would wear at the point where they've managed to claw their way up through society a little bit and really want everybody to know that they're now part of the in crowd. I would give this armor a nine rating. I like it overall. The gauntlets still bother me a little bit. I hunt down those who live in death. The twinned set is clearly inspired by the ancient world of classical Greece and Rome, but here that's really turned up to 11. The most historical feature that I can identify here is actually the gold helmet. Faceplates like this appear definitely to have been worn at least in ceremonial kinds of, of situations in the world of the Roman Empire. Overall, the look and feel suggests ancient Roman legend, the world of the gods, uh, perhaps even the myth of Castor and Pollux is something that the designer might have been thinking, the, the, the twins uh, of ancient uh, Greek and Roman myth. Overall, it really doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to real functional armor. This is a heavily mythologized piece. In real historical armor, you sometimes do get combinations of metal, but mostly that's steel, which would usually be tinted dark with something like brass or gold to, to get a, a kind of visual contrast between the two. Interestingly, when you put different metals together, it does make them more susceptible to corrosion. You actually get a, a kind of battery action happening. The charges can, can pass between the metals that, that lead to corrosion. This isn't a problem one has 
quite so much with silver and gold. Neither of them are particularly subject to corrosion. Silver will tarnish. Gold is super stable. The twin set doesn't really seem like something for the tarnish. This is clearly an armor that's operating not really even the world of mortals so much. It's kind of in the mythological realm and certainly uh, expensive to make, even if you could make it. I think this is the sort of thing that would have been made by uh, a, a supernatural craftsman and not by a human one. Maybe I would give it a six or seven. It's very creative and really interesting, but if you don't really know its storyline, it doesn't really make a lot of sense as armor per se. The Bloodhound Knight armor is clearly a riff on the name of the helmet. This is a historical style of helmet that was worn in the late 1300s into the early 1400s, and it's known as a hound skull bassinet. When you when you look at it sideways, you can see how it gets that name. It's got the, the pointed snout, reminiscent of a dog. Sometimes it's also called a pig-faced bassinet. But this armor leaves a lot to be desired in terms of its viability in a battlefield situation. There is very poor protection in some crucial areas, most particularly the neck is not well guarded. The entire pelvis area is lacking in plate armor, and you just wouldn't leave that level of exposure if most of your, your body is covered by plate. There's also an absence of plate armor from the knee down to the ankles. If you are riding on horseback, the knee is a really good part of the body to protect. If you're going up against somebody on foot, the knee is right in the guy's face, could be a very easy target for him. So knee protection was in fact one of the earliest parts of the body to get plate protection in the development of plate armor in the Middle Ages. Now, if this is a character who's moving around in a crouched, animalistic sort of posture, perhaps leaving those areas not covered with plate is a, a choice that might give a little bit more flexibility. Obviously, the straps are echoed in the lower legs. These straps don't seem to fulfill a practical function. They seem to be purely aesthetic. Basically, he's wearing kind of heavy, a version of heavy cavalry armor. You would use that with a spear, with a straight long sword, and with a dagger. Those are the main kind of battlefield weapons that go with an armor of this sort. They did have curved two-handed swords but those were more likely to be used by foot soldiers. I suppose this is an armor that might be worn by the tarnished. It's got some features that are advanced and expensive and some features like the leather components that are that are a lot more bargain basement. In a well-made suit of armor, you could actually roll. And there's in fact great footage of a researcher in Europe who's had a, a very good suit of armor made. It's astonishing the kinds of things that he can do, but the armor has to be perfectly fitted to you and it's got to move with your body. I would give this suit a three. I'm not really a fan of this mix and match of a heavy cavalry steel armor on the one hand and this much lighter biker gear, gear style on the other. I, I think they're, they're not really going together too well. A war that wrought only darkness. The Holly Trade Knight. He's in some ways one of the most realistic, with some obvious exceptions. The armor overall, roughly what a, a well dressed knight might wear around the year 1400. On his leg armor around the knee, you'll see little rivet heads, and that pleases me greatly. The rivet heads are pretty much in the right place, and they are what hold those individual plates on the back of the legs. The artist has actually put buckles on the back of the knee armor and apparently I think the thigh armor as well and the very top of the lower leg armor on the back. The metal has been rolled over at the top edge. Imagine the edge of a steel plate. It's got a kind of hardness and sharpness to it and so if it's ever against skin or fabric it's just going to rip that stuff up. Another feature of this armor that I like is the structure of the gauntlets that I see. The gauntlets are, are kind of later in their style but leaving that aside, in this case they're finger gauntlets. Individual fingers are separately plated so that the fingers have freedom of movement as opposed to a mitten gauntlet. There are a couple of weird features about this armor. The shield that you see him wearing. What he's wearing there is a jousting shield. By the time knights start to wear full head-to-toe suits of articulated plate steel, actual shields on the battlefield for those knights 
aren't really all that useful anymore. They continue to use them in the context of the Japs. The shield basically becomes your opponent's target. And in fact, the word target means shield. Another odd feature about this particular suit is that disc that you see at his right armpit. It's called a besigu. It appears mostly on uh, later armors and it's designed to protect the armpit. One other oddity about this suit is the helmet. Uh, aside from the very narrow proportions of it, it's a barrel helm. It's roughly based on a style that goes with armor of a hundred years earlier than the style of armor of the rest of the suit. I would say that the Hugtree Knight armor pretty much does befit the tarnished. It's kind of a high-end armor. This is what, what well-dressed knights are wearing, but it's very distressed in its appearance. It has the feel to me, looking at it, of a knight who has fallen on hard times. Overall, I'd give this armor a 7. It's got a lot of really good features. It could probably have been easily a 9 if I'd been happier about the helmet. If you've enjoyed the video, do subscribe to Jamez and do it soon because Starting to get cold outside. Time is moving on. Burr. Ugh, the earth tree is going to have to burn. In our home.